and welcome to Epic Realms Presents the Game Master's Workshop, where we gather together and help you get over issues with becoming a new GM, or if you've been an experienced GM, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we are here to help you out. We've got a series of topics, and we can answer some of your questions if need be. First of all, we have the father of Forgotten Realms. He's written source material for multiple RPG systems, and most recently has been working with the fate of the Norns at Cleath Living City. Please welcome Ed Greenwood to the Game Master's Workshop. Hi, Ed. Hi! Next we have Chris Jackson. He's known for his many series of pirate and sailing novels, including his most recent book in the five-fold universe, Pacifica. He has written multiple, writ uh, multiple RPG tie-in novels, as well as contributed for books such as Paizo's Ships of the Inner Seas. Welcome Chris Jackson to the show. Ooh. And also author, writer, game designer. He has multiple RPG tie-ins as well, and has had a major hand in multiple fourth edition books and can currently be seen on Twitch's Dungeon Scrawlers channel, where he and in the entire cast is comprised of authors and writers. Welcome, Eric Scott to be. Thank all you. right, guys. It's been awesome having you here. You guys have all been part of the podcast, and you guys all know each other, which is really awesome for a show like this, especially the first episode, especially when we have technical issues right off the get-go. Uh, but hey, here we are, and I was just kind of curious. Let's get to get started. What are some tips that you guys have for starting, you know, new GMs that are starting their first campaign? Uh, we'll start with Ed, and we'll just kind of go down the line here. Sure. Well, first, grow a beard. See? Look at all of us. <laughs> okay, just kidding. You can Sorry, be Eric. any any I trim, shape. I trim mine today, actually. Yeah. Oh, okay, that works. <laughs> you can be any shape, size, gender, whatever. You you do not have to have a beard. Um, looking crazy can help because you know then you're not you're not embarrassed by anything. Uh, to start a campaign, I would say try and get together with a group of people you think you'll have fun playing with. And if you're, if you're running the campaign, like if you're the dungeon master, think of something you want to do in a campaign that probably has something to do with what you think your friends like to play, their style of play, whether it's a dungeon crawl, hack and slash, intrigue, whatever, something you think that they will like, you may be wrong, once you get going, but I would say aim for that at the beginning and have a goal in mind, at least for the end of the first adventure. And then I better shut up now because I would just keep going through the catalog of stuff that you should do. <laughs> well, and we can expand on that as well. Uh, Chris, do you have any, any tips for uh, new GM starting their first campaign? Yeah, um, definitely uh, know your players. And this is where like a pickup game at Gen Con, you know, like a, a Pathfinder Society game or a, or a um, you know, whatever society game where you're not going to know your, your players is completely different. Then you have to kind of just, I don't want to say nerf it, but, but play carefully because you don't know who's going to be offended by what. Um, I'm blessed with a group of players. We've been playing together for like decades, literally. And yes, I'm that old. Um, it's uh, it's very um, embarrassing to go over a trigger point with someone and you see their face kind of fall during during play and then you have to backpedal around it. So know your players. Um, that that's and and if okay if you're if you're playing a a, a pre-made product like a, a game adventure or something like that, be just happen to have one right next to me. I, example. As far as like um, modules and things like that, or adventure paths, I <laughs> I reread them and reread them and reread them and file off some things and do things my way a little bit here and there, you know. Um, unless of course, and I don't I don't run society play or anything else like that, but I've played in it. Those are pretty much set in stone. Um, but um, that's d totally different animal. But um, be familiar with your work if you create it. If it's your own campaign you know be prepared to go sideways that's <laughs> gonna happen <laughs> don't get flustered if it does you know but uh okay yeah know your players first of all what about you eric you have any any good new tips for first campaigners 
Rule number one, don't put so much goddamn pressure on yourself. Right. So many Agreed. people come into gaming and go, oh my God, I got to get it perfect. I got to know all the rules. I, I need to, you know, do good rulings. I need to not upset my players. And I need to like get it absolutely accurate. I need to be Matt Mercer on day one. Right. Right. And the thing is, no, <laughs> no, as, as a GM, you are playing a service role to the rest of the table. You are helping them have a good time and you're helping yourself have a good time. Relax. They're here to help. You're here to help. You're all here to work together. And you know, if you screw up, it's fine. I have been running games for 25 years now and I still screw up rulings all the time, live on Twitch. You could watch it happen in real time and shout at me in the chat and it's fine. Mm -hmm. The point is, don't worry about it so much. The goal is to have fun. So approach your sessions thinking, I'm going to do the best for my players. And if something's not working out, we're just going to change it and make it work better. And that's all you got to do, really. Yes. Yeah, so do you guys have suggestions for, you know, and we'll start with Eric. Do you guys have suggestions for what to do for building that first campaign? Like how to plan it out and get it set and ready to go for your new players? I think what Ed was saying earlier about um, trying to appeal to what your players want mm -hmm. is the key. Um, having, okay, um, over the last few years, uh, it has become a regular practice to have a session zero, which is not the game. You sit down and talk about what the game's gonna be like. Even if you're running a pre-planned a pre module, even if everything is planned out and you have your campaign setting all set, it's still important to sit down with your players and figure out what they like, what they don't like, and what they can't stand. So um, when you're talking about what people like, ask them what books they read, what video games they play, what movies they like, all of that. It doesn't have to be fantasy either. If somebody comes to you and says, I really like Jurassic Park, and you're like the original, and they're like, no, the, the current Jurassic Park movies, and you could be like, Okay, I, yes. All right, I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to file that away for my planning. Gotcha. Right? <laughs> 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 Ooh, that was subtle. Um, wow. <laughs> and then the, the second thing is that, you like, like what Chris was saying, you got to know where people's uh, lines are. You got to not cross over into something that's going to upset somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody comes to you and says, I cannot stand it, when children are put in peril in the game. You just got to make a commitment to yourself to never put that into the game. I have a couple of players who are really, really upset and will just storm off if that ever happened in the game. So I make it not happen. So, and that can be an interesting challenge um, as a GM. So yeah. yeah, it's important to have that conversation with your, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to take everybody's space. Oh, we have, we have plenty of time. We got a couple hours for this. So we're, we're good. Uh, <laughs> Chris, what about you? What about, uh, again, like when they're sitting down and they're actually like planning the session or the story and things like that, you know, so, for a first time or what's something to make it a little easier for them? Our session zero is generally uh, character creation. And, and I like to, I, I like for everybody. And, and once again, know your players. I like for everybody to give me just a little bit. It doesn't have to be a, a book um, of backstory on their character, you know, just something. You know, were they an orphan? Were they a privileged kid? Were they, are they a bastard royalty? Are they, you know, uh, any, any number of things. And then that allows me to work all of that into the story. I learned storytelling by GMing and then I became a writer. So if for anybody out there that wants to be a writer, GMing is a great way to learn to be a storyteller because that's what you're doing you are creating a a tableau that the, you you you've got all the three legs of the stool you've got the setting you've got the um characters and you've what's the third one <laughs> what <laughs> plot action uh, and so the plot and the sure. setting are all you but the characters are taken you know but you have to know the characters you have to kind of know 
where are they going to go? And right. then realize no matter how meticulously you plan, they will go someplace else. Absolutely. Yeah, ex expect yeah. that. Yeah, definitely. You, you pretty much expect that. And don't get upset when it happens and, and don't, you know. It's a, it's a feature, like not a bug. Get, it, the more uptight you get, the, the, the more you're going to want to railroad your, your players down your path and not let them do completely foolish suicidal things, which can be hilarious. So, you know, spinning off something that you had just mentioned, I, something we did for years for years was take and they say, give me a one page background of your character. Just write it up. Everybody who does that, you don't have to, but if you do, we'll give you an extra hundred gold for your starting character, extra little something that really doesn't matter in the long run of the game, but it gives the GM, you know, this starey background that they've invested their time in. Cause a lot of right. times, you know, especially new players, they, they're like, oh, I want to play this. And then the next game, they're like, I don't want to play that anymore. I want to play this other thing because they're not invested. But writing a short little story gets them invested in the character. Um, so right. what about you, Ed, for, for GMs when they're creating that system and, and creating the world and getting the characters together and coming up with that story um, for a new time GM to get them invested? I, I would think for me I, I mean i've done it so many different ways and it really does depend on the on your character on your players and and what you think they'll like at the table but but for me if i was starting out of whole cloth from the beginning blank slate i'd be thinking okay i want to have something that has achievable goals so people can feel progress at the end of the first session because one of the things we all have mm -hmm. in life is we don't have that agency I mean, yeah, maybe some uh, GMs and players somewhere um, rule their own small third world country and they can do what they want. And maybe some of us are sitting on um, billions of dollars and, you know, uh, yachts and mansions and so on and can do what we want. <laughs> but most of us don't have that agency. We have to go to school or go to our job and we have to pay bills and we have to deal with all the little um the daily crap of life you know like oh that's the last milk in the fridge oh uh oh why is the cat giving oh because i forgot to feed the cat oh now i've seen their box now i <laughs> double dirty look okay <laughs> it's all the little stuff so um we don't have that feeling of achievement we don't have that feeling of being the hero of saving the day and not every gaming session is going to end with your player character being the shining hero and saving the day. But it would be really nice if that first play session, they can feel a sense of achievement, satisfaction, that they got something done that they don't get done in real life, particularly if they work in a job that is a service job, so you're never done. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to belittle any job in the world, but if right. your job involves saying, would you like fries with that? There's always a next person. There's always a next person. There's always a next person. You don't have that feeling of, I got it done. Whereas the sort of jobs that we have creatively, when you, you write an adventure or you write a novel or short story, we can at least do the dance of doneness because we finished that project. It's done. Right. You know, And so you want to be able to give people that tiny little bit of satisfaction because the one cool thing about role-playing games other than that you can do anything you want, ho ho, um, is that it doesn't have to have one winner and a table full of losers like poker right. or even cribbage mm -hmm. or euchre or whatever thing that our grandparents played. There was a winner and everybody else was a loser of that game. But it, the role-playing game, we can all win things. We can all achieve things. So do something for that first play session that they're going to feel some sort of sense of achievement. Right. The that's, other thing. Right. That's kind of like the hook. Yeah. The, yeah. That's exactly. Your first your first chapter of the novel is the hook. And so if you do as exactly as Ed had said, is give them a give them a, an achievement, something that they have or you know, or hook them into the adventure, you know, or the dead body falls and oh my god, it's the governor and you were the only ones that saw him fall, so you're hooked as the people who have to invent that's that's fantastic great advice yeah your your goal as a gm is not to kill the players or like 
run a really difficult combat encounter. Your goal as a GM is to present a good story that they enjoy and come back for more. That's what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I think uh, tapping into some, um, something that these two gentlemen were talking about before, um, a really good way to make that happen, especially in the first session, is to try and engage each player with something that that character or that player or both want right like if your character is the bastard son of some noble and wants to rec reclaim his ancestral homeland you know you you give him a clue or you have him you know come face to face with somebody who uh, led to him being exiled in the first session he doesn't have to reclaim his title in the first session but he has to get a sense that it's going to happen and then he's right. going to be like bam i'm right there you know mm -hmm. yeah and i i saw that done once i saw a young girl as the dungeon master with even younger girls as her players and she had they are all coming into this village and all the villagers are saying Perhaps you'll be the one. Will mm. you be the one? Will it finally happen? And they didn't know what the villagers were asking about. Just the villagers took one look at their faces and say, oh, they are of the blood of. These are descendants of. Oh, so maybe they will fulfill the prophecy. They didn't know what the prophecy was. They didn't know anything. But obviously all these villagers are looking up and expect something from them. Right. And it's like, oh. But it wasn't a heavy responsibility time because they didn't know what it was. And that brings up the other thing that it's really cool to put in an early session, a mystery. It doesn't have to be a big mystery, particularly if solving mysteries isn't a sweet spot for your players. But we all want a little uncertainty that isn't um, jerking you. And by jerking you, I mean, if you watch a bad horror movie or a bad horror show on television, they are setting up the jump scares with scary music, and you know what's coming, and you're getting, and you feel like you're being jerked around. Okay, and it's tear jerking or whatever, but in this, you're just laying the possibilities out there. There's some uncertainty if you want to go down that road, mm -hmm. but again, if you're leaving them all the roads, and perfect example that that classic scene. I mean, there have been about 40 Wizard of Oz movies, but we all think of the one classic Wizard of Oz movie. Muppets. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. No. Where, the, where, the, where Dorothy doesn't know what road to take, and the Scarecrow's going, you could go that way. Mm -hmm. You could go that way. And, of course, you can set up a scene where you make it clear to them, I'm not going to railroad you. You decide. Yeah. Where you go. But you're also putting uncertainties in so that, oh, there's little things to solve. But you're not handing them the, it has to be you to solve it. You're not putting the heavy responsibility on right away. You want to slowly suck them into the stakes getting bigger and bigger and their actions having consequences in later episodes. But at the beginning, you just want to show them the possibilities. So years and years ago, I, I just want to say one thing. Years and years ago, uh, Fireworks Television, now defunct, was wanted to do a Realms TV show that never happened. And of course, what that really meant was they wanted to do Drizzt. Of course. And and they said, we can save so much money because it'll all be underground. We'll, we'll use the same two studio rooms. We'll just make them look like caves. And everything <laughs> will happen in the cave. And this will save so much money. And then they turned to me and said, Ed, do you have any must-haves that you want to see in this? And I said, yeah. Can I have one shot where we get to see the whole world spread out and the horizon look toward the sunset and have a dragon flying across the sky way in the distance, just enough that we can see when it's it's got bat wings and have some castles on the silhouette and then have the sunset? And they said, that'll cost money. And I said, it's only for 20 seconds. You never have to go out of the caverns again. And they said, well, why would you want that then? Chekhov's gun, you know, the old thing of, if check if there's a gun on the wall in act mm -hmm. one you have to use it before no 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 i want them to know there's a whole world out there so that's right. what i the other thing i need from an early session i want them to know the world is their oyster it's you decide you can go any which way and you can even set up a scene where you know the the, the guy comes in having ridden a horse to death 
it collapses under him and he comes running up and says there's a dragon it's our village the dragon but then you give them they've already had two or three other things to do and they've been sitting around talking about which one okay it's all up to you now right well you can't you can't do both at once what are you going to do and you just leave it for them and they go what you're not going to tell us and you just leave it in their laps and it's like holy crap we get to decide our own destiny this is different from Monopoly or chess. Or... Yeah. <laughs> Chris, what were you going to say? Yeah. So, yeah. One thing I have, have used to really good effect in the first um, opening um, session is to give them a nemesis. Give them a glimpse of the big bad. Just a glimpse. You know, because if they at that point try to confront them, they get their asses whooped. Absolutely. And they know it. But a glimpse of the big bad or what he's done or they have done or something like that, you know, maybe they come on a devastated village or something like that where it's horrific. Uh, But give them a a glimpse of their nemesis, their arch nemesis. Um, That's the looming doom that's going to haunt them throughout this entire thing. And, you know, there, there could be other, all these other things could be mixed in you know, smaller goals, a murder mystery, all of these other things can be totally mixed in, aside from massive tons of treasure and, and you know, avarice, because you're going to have the rogue in the group that just wants to pry the, ma- the jewel out of the magical sword that actually happened in our opening session. <laughs> they found a magical sword, and the, and the rogue was like, oh, I'll I'm taking that jewel, and everybody's like, "No!" no. <laughs> the bonding moment was fantastic. So, yeah, it was wonderful. I want to go back to something uh, that Eric mentioned earlier, and that's going to tie into a question we have in chat. Mm-hmm. And Eric had mentioned that it's your job as a GM isn't to kill play to kill the players. And I, I know, mean, unless that's the kind of game that you all agreed to play, right? Some people are really like that. <laughs> well, that was the, I don't I don't really get it, but it is a thing. So there, there uh, was, we're not here we're not here to shame anybody, right? But there's been many times where the GM goes in with a thought, or a new player or, or a new GM goes in thinking, I have to make sure, like it's me versus them, and it's not you versus them. And that was something that a lot of my friends and people that we know. Uh, and people that I've met all say was kind of one of their first big mistakes is it's not me versus them. We're kind of a team telling a story. Mm -hmm. And one of the people in the chat um, asked, I would love to hear advice on what not to do, specifically ideas that might sound good at first, but can be problematic later. Giving out too many magic items only to later struggle with the imbalance it might create, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I know Eric had seen this question, so he's got a little time to maybe think about it. Do you have an uh, answer? Some any ideas on that? I do have a couple, um, and I'll I'll talk about that to give uh, these gents a moment to think about it. Um, but yeah, these are like when it comes to gaming bugbears, things to avoid in your game. That like you're like, yeah, the bugbear seems like a great thing to include. Oh no! Oh no! That went really poorly. The magic magic item Monty Hall campaigns. Oh my god, I just used that extremely old school term. <laughs> yes. um, when you give your characters too many magic items, too powerful of magic items, it really messes with the balance of the game. It can kind of it can very much disrupt the expectations of the game. Um, I was playing in this game once when we were like eighth or 10th level characters so we had a certain amount of power going into it and like one of the first things that we did in the game was we found this ancient wizard's tower and stole these extremely powerful magical artifacts and then the wizard was after us for the rest of the game and he's like a you know 30th level wizard or something so there's no way we could actually fight this guy and then the whole thing became, how do we, how do we stay hidden? How do we avoid? Uh, it just, it just felt oppressive. And so that can seem like a cool idea that you want to, that you want to chase campaign. Um, but if your players aren't here for that, like they didn't expect that, it's going to make them morose and unhappy. So that's why that session zero is a very important thing. Um, another one I was going to mention is homebrew stuff 
a lot of DMs will tell you don't include homebrew stuff and they um, from players or that players have discovered on D&D Beyond and they're like, oh, this is really neat. Can I use this? And you look at it and you're like, that seems balanced. Sure. Careful. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times that will have unintended consequences down the road. I'm not saying homebrew is bad. I'm saying just be really careful with it. Especially if you're a new GM. Right. If you are a new GM, there is nothing wrong with limiting your players to, I want you to use the player's handbook. Yep. And that's it. And if they say, but I want to... Da, 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 no. Start with the player's handbook. Then expand from there as you become more comfortable. Um, the uh, Adventures League used to do this PHB plus one book thing where you could use the player's handbook and then you could pick one of the book like Xanathar's or the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. Um, but by the time Tasha's came out and Tasha basically grabbed everything from D&D books up to that point and just stuck it in that one book, that rule was kind of falling out of favor a little bit. But it's still not a bad guideline to go against because um, it's much easier to maintain the balance with the PHB and then one other thing rather than all the other things because balancing all of those things together can be really difficult. Okay. What, how about you, Chris? Anything um, that looks good on paper at beginning and then you get through it and it's like, that's a bad idea. Yeah, um, definitely overpowering your characters. Uh, Low-level characters with too much, too high-level, yeah. um, I don't want to call it magical items, but items of any kind. They can be, you know, weapons, tomes, spells, um, golems, NPCs, um, things like that. So you don't want to... Um, give them an NPC that is their, is their catch-all, solve-all, here's our, you know, R2-D2 that picks all the locks and gets through all the doors and da-da-da-da-da-da. Um, make them do the hard stuff. Um, make them make the decisions. Don't have an NPC saying, well, I think we should go this way. Um, it takes away their agency. Um, mm -hmm. um, but uh, definitely overpowering is, is a sin. Mm -hmm. uh, try to keep, well, Try to keep the level of the of the enchantments close to at least the level of the characters, right? Um, so that they're always getting something new. Um, not give them the big warple sword as third level characters, because then that's their well. That's what they're always going to use. Once again, that takes away their agency, their their intuitiveness, their their ability to um, ad hoc to you know. <laughs> So we were fighting uh, my, one of my earliest adventures I was running. Um, we were, they were fighting a vampire in her cave and she had all these supplies lying around. And now magical weapons don't do a lot against vampires. They, they had a lot of resistance to them. But if you pick up a 40 pound ham and throw it, it's going to knock her against something. <laughs> so, you know, F equals MA. It's like, so, and one of the characters had this throw anything feat. So she had all of these provisions lying around, barrels and hams and stuff like that. And she was throwing stuff at her. It was working perfectly. So, of course, <laughs> then she turned into a bat and flew away. But, you know. <laughs> but it, it was, it was a, a solve that I hadn't considered. I just said, here's her larder and it's all this stuff. And then she shows up and, and they were going to have a horrible fight. Then she got hit in the face with a ham. And how about you? Any any good? Uh, looks good on paper, but doesn't turn out the best. Or I would just say, as a general rule, um, don't make things too easy and quickly achieved at the beginning, because then it's there's no feeling of satisfaction in it and achievement. It's almost like it's a hollow victory. It it's cheap. It's worthless. Um, at the same time, you don't want people to be frustrated. You don't want it to be as bad as real life. So, hey, where's the fun in this game? <laughs> but but you do want them to have to um, stretch themselves to, to get things. Um, 
we were talking earlier about overpowered magic items. And I recall a very early campaign um, I played in, in which the opposite was true. We were all loaded down with tons of magic items. And what it meant was we were going to get attacked by everybody. And every ruler was going to come up to us and say, you have to do this and this and this and this because you have the sacred mantle of so-and-so. And it was like, then the next time we found a treasure, it was everybody back away from the magic items. No, you can have it. No, I'm, I'm not even touching that. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> again, it's, it's all in how it's managed and it's all in how it plays out at the table. So I would say the things to do is to lay the groundwork at the beginning and leave loose ends. Um, increasingly few people in the younger generation have seen a movie called Tom Jones, which is uh, an adaptation of the famous novel. And so I'm I'm going to partially ruin this movie for you because I'm. I oh no! Spoilers. Uh, yeah, <laughs> because there is uh, there is a character in this movie, a bystander that the 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 lead character of the movie tom jones himself sees again and again in the background as a spectator throughout the movie so at key points in his life key moments this guy is just watching him from a distance and you as the viewer of the movie gets to see him he's all he's in frame and after the third or fourth time you start looking for him yeah there he is watching again you don't know who he is or why he's there that's a dungeon master laying pipe for later <laughs> on in the campaign because you don't know why this character is there. And you as the dungeon master may not know why the character is there because you're setting something up for later. Don't worry. Your players will figure out for you what it is later on. They'll say, that's obviously the spy. of the." You go, yes, yes. I'm so brilliant. I set it up from the very beginning. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but you're doing dozens of these little things what uh, what is now um, called fan service but you're putting in little details here there and everywhere that may never go anywhere you're leaving loose ends and that used to be the old rule that i applied to creators working in the realms in the early days for each loose end you tie off i need three new ones added to the world so it doesn't feel like we're using up the world mm -hmm. if you take something from an earlier source book and say, oh, this is the lost heir of this kingdom. Okay, I need three new things added in for each one you use up. So the same thing, you're adding loose ends and you're leaving it up to the players which ones they follow. They may never follow anyone or they may go down a road and fight the big baddie and then look around at each other and say, so what do we do now? And somebody will say, do you remember the third thing? We went to this tavern and there was that that thing. Oh, yeah. And then they all get on their horses and they ride back to the tavern. And you go, ah, thank you for coming up with the next story for me. Thank you. Uh, which is actually not just being lazy and cheap as a dungeon master. It is, but never mind. Uh, it's also they are choosing the story. They have full agency. They are going in any direction they want to go in and doing what they want to do. And that is what sets the role-playing game apart from reading a great fantasy novel where the writer has to make all those choices for you. Or any other game, whether it's a track game like Sorry or Steeplechase or Parcheesi or whatever it is where the game rules put you on a track and you have to do this. And when you get to a certain point, the game is over. The whole beauty of role-playing games is you tell your own story, and you go in your own direction, and you get to be master of your own fate and soul. Give them the chance to do that. And then, you know, when you kill them all with the dragon, well, you know, they decided to go and fight the dragon, not you. The loose ends thing is exactly why my campaigns get so so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, we killed the we killed the bad guy. Yeah, a bad guy. <laughs> A bad guy. <laughs> his cousin. But the, one thing I'll, I will say is, is you know, making things complicated like that, and giving 
giving the um, players all this agency to go all these different directions does add to your work as a GM mm -hmm. because lots of times you'll have prepared where you think they are going to go and they will not go there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you they will never go there. Think on it. Um, right. it's, so we could probably morph this into shooting from the hip. Um, I've run entire adventures shooting from the hip, just making stuff up as I go along. Um, and they usually turn out pretty good, um, but it is nice to have some framework, um, at least, of, of you know what's around you so that if they go, and not if, when they go a different direction, <laughs> mm -hmm. you'll be moderately prepared to handle that. Right. So. Yeah, That's definitely. why I created a complete detailed fantasy world, so they could go in any direction. And instead of my going, uh, 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 there, there were 500 orcs uh, blocking your path in a huge army, and behind them there's a mountain. It's belching fire, and dragons are coming out of it. Don't go in that direction. <laughs> you know, it's, I never have to do that because I could just say, sure. Well, off to your west, you see this, and off to your north, you see this, and uh, because you know, that's what you do. You, you you've got. You've got 50 years of your life to devote to this, don't you? Right. Sounds Actually, like we're starting to get into the GM style yep, question. Yep, that's where I was yeah. just going to go. I, I wanted, <laughs> yeah, go there. This, is a good, this is a good transition. Yeah. I wanted to add one more thing as a, um, a word of warning to fairly new GMs. Be careful with the house rules. Yeah. It can be very tempting to say, I don't like a couple of these mechanics. I'm going to replace them with something else. And then just rule that for your players. Just tell them up front, this is how it's going to be. We're going to do it differently. And this is how. Because two problems. One, that can be really confusing for your players. Especially because if they they're can, new. Especially if they're new. Because they can read something in the book that contradicts it. And then they're not sure if it applies, how it, how it interfaces. And two, it can lead to unanticipated results. I'll give you an example. Back when I was a kid playing AD&D, the second edition, there was a guy who somehow convinced our DM, and I was the DM for part of it, so this is partly my fault, that there was a thing called rage. Now, this was before barbarians existed as a class, okay? But it, it also had nothing to do with, you know, any class that could do something like this. He said, I am attacking with rage. And I'd be like, what does that mean? He's like, it means I'm really angry. And so I'm hitting extra hard. I'm like, okay, fine. So he's like, it gives me a plus two to hit. I'm like, okay, sure. It also lets me do double damage. I'm like, okay. And, and making and, and saying, okay, that one time led to just a ripple effect of everybody being enraged all the time <laughs> and just doing ridiculous amounts of damage and just ruining the game so he was a ranger by the way i think he was trying to make rangers cool but then again rangers were pretty cool in second edition so they didn't mm -hmm. really need any help anyway be careful with house rules there are some very easy and very um very easily fit into the campaign house rules. Like for instance, I don't care about encumbrance that much. I find encumbrance kind of, uh, it's like looking at an Excel spreadsheet and I do enough of that in my day job. <laughs> it, it feels like bookkeeping to me. I also don't care too much about uh, ammunition and you know food supplies and stuff. If you want to get that granular and keep track of all that stuff, that's fine. But I, my games usually don't. And so what I tell my players is encumbrance isn't a thing unless it gets ridiculous. Like if you're carrying around 10,000 gold pieces, that's going to be really heavy. If your, you know, noodle arms sorcerer with the strength of six is picking up the, the half orc who weighs 400 pounds, no, that's not going to happen. So um, that kind of vague house rule can be useful but again just be careful with it you know discuss it with your with your players rather than try and stipulate something right definitely well we were talking about the finding your style and we will take a break somewhere in here 
uh, coming up. But let's uh, yeah. let's talk about finding our style and how we do that. Because no GM is the same, as it says on the screen. No GM is the same. Everybody's a little bit different. Whether you're amazing at modules, horrible at modules, uh, I'm 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 horse crap when it comes. You put a module in front of me, I'm like, I'll spend hours highlighting stuff, and I'm like, oh no, I got that one thing, that one detail wrong, and it's crucial because in later, you know, stuff like that. But I'm when Chris mentioned seat of the pants, I'm I'm much better seat of the pants GMing or you know kind of rough outline. Um, but some people are really good with, you know, coming up with combat scenarios or or the crunch, as it were, where you're coming up with the details. So how do you guys come across, um, how did you come across finding your own personal style and what do you think that style is for yourself? And we can start with that because I know we've had this conversation in the past. Off oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the problem with um, personal style is one of the things I've had to do over the years of, you know, being older than dirt was play test stuff for almost every edition of D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has meant is quite often I didn't have a choice in style. You're you're asked to do this. You know, we're going to try it with this falling damage. Okay, now we're going to try and run the same scenario, only the falling damage is going to be like this. Now I want you to role play everything with full dialogue and intrigue. Now we want to play it like a football game where the party caller is the quarterback and he says, you do this, you do this, you do this. Okay, Dungeon Master, that's what we're doing this round. You know, it, it so the style morphs to fit the assignment. So there's a difference between the style you end up in at a particular table with a particular group of players in a particular night in a particular situation and the style you would want to do if it was just you. And so there's the difference between your druthers and what you end up doing. I mean, the druthers for me is is the ham acting. We role play everything because otherwise, why are we role playing? Right. Why are we playing this game? And that was the sort of thing that used to really annoy me at some Gen Cons and other large conventions because it's, you'd say, well, you're in the throne room. The king's right there on the throne. Talk to him. Okay. I'll talk to him. I'm rolling to see if I uh, right. uh, convince him. No, no, no. Talk to him. Give me the words. And I will role play the king back to you. Because then, oh, no, I don't want to do that. And, of course, that's a difference in playing style. Mm -hmm. To me, that was like robbing the whole, why, why are we playing D&D &D and not, you know, Monopoly? If if you just want to do this, you know. Um, but, but again, it's it's what you and your players like. And uh, to put that back to starting the campaign and the stage fright and the, you know, what many groups have discovered, particularly when they feel slightly embarrassed because they're playing with their parents or grandparents or somebody else they're not, they don't know, or a teacher or authority figure, or they're not comfortable because we're all supposed to be elf maidens and we're all 500 pound guys with beards, you know. Um, so they, the the way out of that is to do the Monty Python thing. They put on your silly voices. If you're older than Monty Python, like me, then it's Goon Show, which is what the Monty Python crew grew up listening to and learned from. But it's it's you put on the funny voice, or you put on your favorite funny voices from lines in movies. I mean, my father's generation did. They all did John Wayne impersonations, you know pilgrim you know sort of thing it's whatever they would grab from right and that would be their way in to overcoming the thing and getting the style rolling but for me it was because the style had to do with the ham acting and i could care less if we got through one room or half a room in a three-hour play session if everybody was having fun portraying that, their character that is the word right there the three-letter word yeah fun Fun. The whole point of RPGs is fun. And that's why we need to know our players to begin with, what their idea of fun is. And um, exactly what you said earlier about the player that doesn't want to role play, this is a role playing game. Um, in my view, that's the fun. That's a huge part of the fun. And if you're playing, uh, if you have a bunch of people in the room who want to play D&D, or Pathfinder or any any role playing game, but I don't want to role play. They're just playing a dice game. 
Mm -hmm. And it can be fine if that's what you want right. to do. Right. If that's what they want to play, great. Um, it would be a lot easier to play something like Gloomhaven or or a board game that has role playing elements that doesn't have a lot of the role playing parts. And you can have a hell of a, a lot of fun playing like the cooperative board games. I we play a lot of them and they're fantastic. In fact, they got their start from role playing games because there's no, you know, it's not a competition. It is a, a cooperative game, just like a, a role-playing session is a cooperative against the game itself. Um, and, and, you know, that was something, that was a, a game changer. <laughs> oh, dear. Nicely I, done, sir. The whole nice. it, was a, it was a game changer for board games because until RPGs, came, until D&D came out, nobody thought of a, of a real cooperative board game. And then somebody came up with, you know, I, I can't remember what some of the first ones were, but man, there are some fantastic ones out there. Gloomhaven's fantastic. Um, Deep Madness is just an unbelievable game. Um, and uh, we've played through these. Um, and this, this is the other thing. Any game is a role-playing game. You can play Monopoly and mm -hmm. be the dog or be the shoe or be the car. You know what I mean? If you have enough imagination. And so the, these are the kinds of people I like to play games with. I, you know, and we had basically this panel at a, at a, um, at a convention once. And one of the guys was the GM that doesn't, you know, he, oh, I don't like the whole, you know, making stuff up, you know, the silly accents and stuff like that. And, and all the other GMs up there looked at him and go, you, you do realize this is a role-playing game, right? Yeah, you're playing a role. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he didn't like that stuff. He just wanted to roll dice and, and get the results and take the treasure and do the tallies and stuff like that. All right. I, well, I had a DM like that once who actively discouraged us from role-playing. He was like, if I see you role-playing, I will have something bad happen to you. I just want there to be combat, and I just want you to go to stores periodically. And I was like, no <laughs> i stuck around for a few weeks but i couldn't do it after that it's just yeah. so so antithetical to how i see the game going but i mean that's again that's totally fine if that's the way your table wants to play right and and i wanted to um to ask since we're talking about gming style my style is almost entirely improvisational like I have a little bit, like I might have a, a thought in my head about what the characters might encounter, what monsters I think would be neat to, for them to encounter. And I might have built a map, but otherwise what happens at the table depends on what they do at the table. Um, I, ha I have story beats in my head. Like I want them to encounter this person at some point. And this person is gonna tell them it's this or they're going to encounter this dragon who is attacking the city and the city is going to be significantly damaged, whether they defeat the dragon or not, right? And that's part of the campaign. But how they get there is as much up to them as it is up to me. Right. I, you know, my games tend, to, um, there's kind of a spectrum between sandbox and rails, <laughs> right? Like a game like World of Warcraft is pretty sandboxy. Like you can go around and do all kinds of things, but to progress the story, you're starting to get closer to the Rails sort of game. A Rails game would be like um, any game. <laughs> like most, most video games are on the Rails games where you are going a particular path and there may or may not be side quests that you can do on the way, but you are going from point A to point B to point C to point D, and then you're at the end game. And so there's this wide spectrum of kind of games that you could be running. So the improvisational style goes to the sandboxy sorts of games. So those are the kind of games that I want, that I usually play. What about you guys? Well, I wanted to step in real quick on a previous topic that was brought up. Because yeah, somebody had mentioned in the chat, I was going to say, I am a new and novice D&D person. Role-playing makes me anxious and nervous, especially when you're playing with veteran players. 
and just shutting maybe shutting down a new player because they don't want to role play right away seems like it's a bad idea. Maybe mm -hmm. the people who start off could get at that point at some point, but initially it might just be scary and a lot of anxiety. And I believe that uh, being sensitive to that would be the way to go. Um, they can always get into role playing later. And somebody said that this is a great question. Yeah, what would you do to is. help encourage one of your players, maybe with a little experience or a little anxiety about role playing to develop their character and feel more comfortable in this position? That is a great topic. It really I'm is. I'm so glad you asked that question. Yeah. Too bad we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> well, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. Maybe we'll let you guys think about that. We will go to a break and we'll come back from break. Everybody can go to the bathroom and we can spend more time covering it instead of rushing through that. Sound yeah, good to you guys? I, yeah, I definitely want to discuss this. I want this to discuss that too as well. So we'll be right back, guys. Stick around. Uh, we will be right back in about five, 10 minutes with the rest of the show. So we'll see you then. Awesome. The next question is, uh, will you be hosting a Flapjacks and Sasquatches World Championship? I have the 2016 World Champion flannel. I need to defend it. Very nice. Yes, that will be at Con of the North. Okay. I was actually just emailing back and forth with the Envoy people today, trying to figure out when we have to get that stuff in. So that will happen at Con of the North. I think that we are maybe past our capability to do a bacon belt this year, just because of how far we are into October right. and how intense my October is. So we may we may take a hiatus year from the bacon belt, but there will be a world championship. Did the at bacon the belt come with the, did, did the bacon belt come with the acquisition? I know, well, like the physical object. I did yeah. not receive a physical object the day that uh, John's basement <laughs> contents you, were you, emptied have into you seen my that? garage. Have you seen the actual physical belt? I have seen pictures of okay. it, um, like on the Facebook pages and stuff. I don't believe that I have ever been in its presence. Okay. The way the way I usually describe it, uh, quickly, the elevator pitch. I guess. Yes, yes, the elevator is pitch. A guy discovers that he lives in a computer-generated reality. And that by by manipulating this file that he's found, that he can change the nature of reality. And he immediately makes such a huge mess that he ends up escaping to the distant past to medieval England to hide out basically until the until the heat is off. And uh, he he figures he'll disguise himself as a wizard back there using his ability to manipulate reality. And immediately he finds an actual wizard. And then, you know, discovering things about that wizard and about how how the world works back there, that's where the story begins to unfold. You were there from the get-go. Um, <laughs> Let's uh I was there before it was Shadowrun. Uh I was in Chicago for a meeting with the Fossa crew, and uh, we were out at dinner and Jordan Weissman raised the conversation. Okay, what's going to be the next big thing? You know, because they were looking for another property. Right. Um, and uh, this was back in the 80s. So, and so in terms of properties that were different at the time, I suggested Cyberpunk. Um, this was before uh, Mike Pondsmith did his cyberpunk was out. Right. Um, and uh, Jordan wasn't too sure about that. When you're working, especially in that era, were you still a fan just as much as you were a worker? Or was it like, now that I'm working here, there's no, there's no... And we're back from break, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. We are here with Ed Greenwood, Chris Jackson, and Eric Scott DeBee. See, I got it right again. Um... <laughs> We're talking about game mastering, first time game masters. And before we went to break, it was brought up that it's hard for sometimes for new players to um, to do the role play, to be, get in character, especially when they're on veterans players, uh, because they haven't been doing it. They get anxiety. They don't, you know, there's always the fear of judging or being looked at a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them, they just want to roll the dice because they're anxious to play in a character or or do voices or just, you know, just talk as their character. So what would be a good way of kind of getting them in there or easing them into it, or at least, you know, working with that? Well, I want to echo back one of the things that I said about becoming a new DM and approaching a new game. 
don't put so much pressure on yourself. No one is expecting you to be perfect or exactly in line with the group. And if they are, leave that group. <laughs> okay. Uh, gamers as a culture often have a kind of, I described it in the chat as a gatekeepery attitude where they're like, this is the way the game is supposed to be played. And if you're not playing it the way I want you to, you're doing something wrong. And that is not the case. Role-playing games, by definition, can be played various ways, okay? The way you present your character is entirely up to you, and however you feel comfortable doing it is the right way to present your character. If you are not into doing a lot of RP or you feel a little bit intimidated um, going into it, you know, it's okay to hang out in the back and not say a whole lot and just kind of do your thing. Um, maybe don't play the face of your party who is constantly talking to people and like making all those charisma checks because that can be, that can be a lot to deal with. <laughs> like I, when I play, which is rare because I'm, I'm a forever DM kind of guy, but when I play, I tend to be, um, someone who hangs out in the back and when a fight starts, they take care of it. Like, that's my thing. I like inflicting a lot of damage real fast and feeling like, mm, yeah, and not doing a whole huge amount of role playing because as a DM, I'm doing that all the time. And sometimes I just want to kind of relax and just be, I don't want to say murder hobo, but you know, it, <laughs> there's a little bit of that. People run games for me and they're like, I watch your gaming and you're not this brutal. And I'm like, I have a lot of repressed rage to take out. <laughs> so it is, what I'm saying is, it is okay if you get to the table and you are not, not there to do heavy role-playing initially. Just stretch, practice. I mean, these guys and myself, we've been doing this for decades. Like we are very accustomed to gaming, all kinds of different games, not just D&D, and we like, um, I have played almost every sort of character I can imagine. And then there are, there are more that I will play in the future. Okay. So I, I have a lot of experience with this and it is like, I, I feel very confident because I have all that experience. If you don't have a lot of experience to draw upon, it is fine to build up your confidence, uh, by slowly. And a, a DM, a GM who is worth their weight in good times will sympathize and give you that space that you need. And if your GM's not doing that, you need to have a conversation and then you might need to leave the game if your GM is a dick. And if you're don't a new GM, dicks. and if you're a new GM, here's, here's another tip. Don't do that. <laughs> right, exactly. That, that goes back to my rule one about almost anything in life, being a writer, being a GM, being a, a person, rule one is don't be a dick. Um, and, and so, and this kind of comes back to, as far as the role-playing thing goes, to knowing your players a little bit. Um, and, you know, I always try to, you know, encourage them to role-play if they want to, um, but I'm not going to pressure anybody into, into it. I will make them actually say what they want to say to to the king, but I'm not gonna make him do it in a pride accent, I, you know, I do that. Just, it just comes out of my mouth. Um, and, uh, but if, if they want some encouragement as to what to role play, just tell them, think of your favorite movie characters. You know, think of your favorite comic characters. Think of, you know, your favorite Avenger character. Who do you wanna be, you know? And just kind of gives them ideas. Wait, you mean I could be Scarlet? I could be I could be um, the Scarlet Witch, or yeah, absolutely, you can be anything you want. Really? And I've had that response from people before. It's like, really? I can, especially reluctant gamers that you have to kind of talk them into. Well, just sit sit in on a session and see if you like it. And well, I want to play a centaur. Okay, you're a centaur. Really? Okay, let's go. <laughs> Yeah, so, you don't have to be you. You could be whatever you want. Exactly. And there's there's something freeing about that. 
being able to step into a totally different role. Right? That, is the, that is the true joy. One of the true joys of, of role playing, uh, playing a role playing game is not being yourself. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And if you're nervous, if you do have stage fright, and if you're intimidated by, you know, veteran players around you who have wandered in chatting with the DM on first name basis, plonked down 40 rule books, gotten out six sets of dice and go, okay, let's kill some, you know, blah, blah, ass, blah, and you're going, oh no, I don't even know my spell list or whatever. Um, some of the ways that the dungeon master can help smooth that situation is give all of the characters a small problem to solve together that requires all of them to participate mm -hmm. and then all the non-player characters played by the dungeon master are speaking in character to all of the characters my lord uh, i don't you think it would be better if we rested the horses first that sort of thing and so the chance for conversations in character is happening all around them and it seems normal and it doesn't seem like they're being put on a spot it's not like there's a a classroom full of their classmates judging them or their parents because it's parent teacher night and everything is set up to and what will you do and then right. dead silence falls right. so that it's like ah, 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 ah. you know you're not you don't want to put them on the spot you want to involve them in this come help me with this i can't carry this alone come on all of you um and that sort of thing you get them involved in something and you get everybody talking in character and then you're still leaving it up to them how much comes out of their mouth how right. comfortable they feel but you're giving them the chance to just step into the stream step into the flow without the spotlight and said, and what will Relnon do? Right. And Relnon's player goes, ah, 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 you know. <laughs> and, and that's that's exactly where good NPCs come in to, to kind of prompt the player to go a certain direction or, you know, act a certain way or or even be belligerent, you know. Um, you know, he can whisper, don't worry, he's just a coward, and oh, kick his ass, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Things like that, you know, it's like don't be afraid, you know. Yeah. And so, the more you play with this group of players, the more you will understand how each person reacts to something. Uh, you know, some players really thrive when you put them in the spotlight and you say, "You, Ed, what does your character do?" And Ed will just seize your game and take it down a totally different direction. <laughs> So don't do that with Ed, right. but some players will really thrive on that. And You're some players, if you pull them aside and put them in the spotlight and say, what does your character say? Everyone's looking at you. They will go, uh, 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 don't do that. Right. Don't, 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 don't put people on the spot if they don't thrive on that. I have also, a... also, I wanted to say one last thing, yeah. which is that. It is totally okay to just describe what your character does rather than say, I do this, or say, this is what I say. If you say, my character goes to the king, whispering in his ear, wheedling words uh, that are confusing him and um, playing to his vanity, like, I think that's fine. You can make a charisma check based on that. You don't have to tell me exactly what you say. Some players really like to, 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 to put on the voice or voices are always optional. Some characters, some players really like to say, this is what my character says. And some players like to say, um, this is the kind of thing that he's doing. Not, I, think I, I once played with somebody who would often say, my character has a charisma of 20. I have a charisma of 10. So my character convinces the guard that this is the right way to go about things in a good charismatic way that I myself can't emulate. And I'm like, I get you, go ahead and make a roll. So, I mean, that's okay. Just be sympathetic to what your players, how they like to play the game. You took that right out of my notebook. Like I had that written down. I'm like, I, I kind of <laughs> want to mention this, that, you know, characters will say, they would say this, but I don't have the same stat as so-and-so. 
another thing that I wanted to mention uh, that I've had done in the past, because what this one person had mentioned is something I've run across in the past, and that's give them a notebook and say, okay, when it's your turn, he's going to ask you this. You don't have to worry, but write down. Give them time to write down what they want to say, and then they can just read what they wrote down. Yeah, so if they're give like, them some time to think about it. Yeah, so they can like literally just write it down. They don't have to be on the spur of the moment. They don't have to improv. They can go, well, this is... And they can also do what you guys mentioned. Like, this is kind of what I'm getting at with what I say, and then they can just read it. For years, I have loved you from afar. So now... <laughs> But that can get them get them in there and used to it. So, um, my dearest Esmeralda, <laughs> this is my very favorite gun. <laughs> it has been four turns since I have last addressed you. <laughs> so our and, next and, one, and, and yet uh, l consider the John Carter movie, the John Carter of Mars movie, and remember the running joke that they all refer to him as Virginia. <laughs> so what yeah. I first said, and and I mean that that keeps harking back to that. You could be misunderstood, and you could still forge on. Right. So our next little topic uh, on the list of topics, and then we'll get to another uh, chat question. Um, what are our some of our because it's let's put ourselves in a frame of reference for them to prove like not everybody is perfect, not every GM is perfect. And this kind of plays off of the finding your style because everybody has strengths and everybody has weaknesses. Um, and and it's, it's, it's not easy to self-reflect, but when you can and you have that capability of self-reflection, you kind of can focus on getting better at the at your own personal weaknesses as whether it's, you know, as working at a fast food restaurant, as writers, as GMs. Uh, what would you say that some of your weaknesses, I kind of mentioned it earlier for me, like I'm horrible at modules. I can't like, I can run them, but that's kind of my weak point. And I've been focusing on them myself recently for the exact reason. So I can get better at them. Um, so Ed, what, what would you say is like one of some of your weaknesses compared to your strengths? Oh, rem uh, particularly as I get older and particularly as I do more and more editions of the same game, which is one of the reasons I always used to get annoyed when, certain game companies wanted to issue a new edition of the game. It's like, <laughs> you mean I have to know all the same different rules now? And you use the same words from edition to edition, but they mean different things now and it works differently? Screw that. I just want to have, have a good fun story. I don't want to remember all these um, rules at the table. That's too much like work. And it's <laughs> too much like other games. It's not role play. I just want to have a fun time telling a story. So if you give me the sort of uh, combat that is going to consume the entire evening, and we're going to have to consult um, higher mathematics of various ways and ratios, and we're going to have to figure out burst circles for for uh, weapons, and we're going to have to figure out prevailing wind speed. It's, it's like, screw that. I just want to, this happens. Right, we move on. And, and that's, <laughs> that's what I want to do. And therefore, I feel a pronounced weakness on the occasions upon which I am supposed to be running a competition tournament module for people who have paid money to be at the table and it matters to them whether they succeed or not and therefore I have to get the rules right. No fudging, no, oh, we'll just have this happen. I, I have to get it right because the survival of their character or how successfully they do may depend upon the in, the interpretation of the rule and that just makes my head hurt it's like can we go back to just having fun again <laughs> because for me it's not fun to do that other thing i'm right. not a mathematician i'm not good at ratios particularly on the fly my father who was the physicist and mathematician who always used to bail me out has been dead for like a decade he's not going to be there to bail me out if i go hey dad What's the square root of, you know, and, and I will have the instinctive reaction I had as a young kid. Who the hell cares? And, you know, <laughs> we're not building bridges here that we don't want to fall down. I leave that to the engineers because I know I'm no good at it. Damn it, I'm playing an engineer in this game, though. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. So, so well. <laughs> my problem was I was actually playing with an engineer 
and a computer scientist. Oh. One of our <laughs> games. So when it came down to ratios, I just turfed it. I took, so Joe, how, you know, here's a puzzle. Oh, well, this is a simple problem. Da -da 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 -da. I just let him run with it, you know? Yeah. Okay, problem solved. He's the rogue anyway, so he's going to be the one who picks the locks anyway, right? Or right. solves the problem. And so, um, but uh, yeah, my major issue, my major problem early, as an early GM was railroading. I wanted to tell a story. I had this world. I had this nemesis. I had this track in my mind where I wanted them to go. And by God, they were going to go there. And since I'm God, I can make them go there, right? Well, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> but but it was fun, it, and it was an unbelievably valuable growing experience experience to learn how to um, go different directions because your players will go different directions, and and to um, God forbid, split the party. And and try to run things simultaneously. You know, it's like, okay, this is happening over in this room while this is happening over in this room. Cut. You. Go. Da -da 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 -da. Cut. You. Go. When they're only like 15 feet apart, but they're exploring two different rooms because they're bastards. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I mean? Yeah. And, and then it, it, it can add actually a little bit of tension if they ever split the party and you're doing something like that. And somebody discovers something that the other party really should know, like there's a ticking bomb in the other room, but they don't. And when someone says, but, but, but they should shut up, you know, <laughs> you don't know that's happening. Right. And that's, less, that's, a, that's a valuable lesson to teach your players in splitting the party is you don't know what's going on over there. You have no commentary as a player or as your character. You have zero commentary. You cannot comment. And they're sitting there going, but, 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 turning purple, right. which is entertaining. So everybody has fun. <laughs> my, my greatest GMing weakness is kind of along the lines of what Chris was just talking about, which was not trusting my players. When I was younger and I was running games, I always knew better than them. I knew what would make a better story. I knew the right way to fight the villain. And if they didn't do it, I would punish them. Well, I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily like hit them with lightning from the sky, but I would, I would make it so that their encounter did not go very well. You know, if they were cheesing my boss, I'd get really upset about it. And I'd be like, I put in all this effort and I can't believe it. You assholes are doing this. I was 13. Okay. So like, let's put this in perspective. Okay. Eventually, over time, I learned that sometimes the players are producing just as much good story as I am. And eventually, I learned that, you know, if you, if you know your players and you trust your players, they will produce as much good adventure as you, the DM, could ever do with your plans, which is yeah. part of why I improvise so much. My weaknesses now tend to be more along the lines of, I mentioned something. I okay. I opened three loose ends when you killed that boss, and I don't remember where they were going. And this was six months ago. But now you assholes are going to pull something up and say, "Hey, when we fought the vampire, didn't we find this thing?" And I'm like, "Crap, crap, crap, crap. What was that? What was that?" <laughs> and I, I because because I'm so improvisational. And I don't have all everything planned out and written down. I don't always know what what things were going to be. I know I was thinking of something good at the time, but I don't remember how it went. And I don't take notes most of the time, and I so I keep it all in my head. And that oh, is not a good. Eric. Idea. Eric. Yes. Hey, we're talking about biggest weaknesses here, yeah, man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> my biggest weakness is my head. My weakness was that I had a father. Who was a prof? Oh, and, and he oh. grew up. He grew up during the Great Depression. So you know how you have all these examination books that are all absolutely identical, and the prof has to destroy all the unused <laughs> examination books at the end of the exam, so nobody can take a blank book home, copy from their friends, come back and get a perfect. You know. So, but 
he grew up during the depression. You do not throw away paper or anything else, because if you do, you know, someone will starve. And then if in the second world war, Mr. Hitler will win the war if you waste stuff. So he right. brought home all the blank books and they were piled around the house because we might use them someday. So as a dungeon master, I was doing what you were doing, but I was writing in longhand frantically throughout all our play sessions at top speed, all over everything, everything we did, all the names of every NPC, what they did with every bauble, every piece of trash. Every time they had to go to the loo in the middle of the wilderness, I wrote down all the stuff. So they were anim there were animals, monsters that were tracking them by their poop. <laughs> and I was keeping track of it all. <laughs> so, so for the Westgate Irregulars campaign that I'm running every Wednesday on Twitch, <laughs> um, we have a just fantastic supporter of the show, old friend of mine, uh, who guest plays occasionally, Allie Pitchford, who basically writes up summaries of every session that we do to post them on the on the day of the new game so that everyone can catch up to what happened. But I also read those summaries to remind myself what happened. <laughs> and it I is, love it. If, if you cannot assign one of your players to take notes, try harder because that is a really good thing to do. Right. If you get a player who will take notes and if you get a player who will draw maps, you have lucked out my friend because those are great things to have. Yeah, that's that's the engineer I work with. She actually has a leather-bound tome that she uses for her adventures, and she writes notes copiously. So oh my god, amazing! Go, Wait a second, <laughs> what was that guy's name, Kim? And she's like, "Oh, that was so and so." Yeah, him. So he's the <laughs> one that now has the bobble. Da 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 da. So yeah. All right, all right. I want to tell a related story. This this has nothing to do with with game design, and I'm sorry about this, Nick. But That's okay. You're going to enjoy this. So, um, this came out a few years ago. That Bob Salvatore, our old friend Bob, occasionally forgets what magic items Jarlaxle oh, has yeah. access to. So he will go on message boards, not under his own name. Yep. And say, hey, I'm putting Jarlaxle in my game. What kind of magic items does he have? And then just wait as people like <laughs> fill up the replies and then make notes of that so that he can put it into his next book. It is wow. amazing. And that is the best strategy. That's when you great. have when you have a fan base of millions, like uh you have extra extra pressure on you, but at the same time, they are a resource if you figure out how to tap them. So we have another anyway. we have another question, and that's mm -hmm. is hilarious. Um, it's it's less of a question and more of a comment, and I want to get your guys' take because this is a person who's a regular uh, on the stream here, comes in quite a bit, and every time the subject of role playing comes up in any kind of a chat, um, he mentions this, and I want to get your guys' take. He awesome. hasn't played D anD D, he hasn't role played, but he really wants to. Uh, he mm -hmm. himself is. Um, autistic and would like to play a character that's autistic uh what are your guys's suggestions for making and playing a character of that type well i think you should totally do this yeah that's great and here's what i told him, and, and you guys can spin off of it because I've, I've answered this for him in the past is that that's that can be a role-playing aspect you don't have to have character sheet notes or certain feats or traits or anything like that to role play that you can just role play it as a character, as we mentioned before, and that's was the lot the the quick version of what I said. But get your guys's take on that. Yeah, trying to make mechanical implications of um, uh, neuroatypical um, how your brain works differently from other people in a mechanical way, like my character gets bonuses to this and penalties to this. That is a slippery slope that doesn't lead anywhere good. Okay, uh, it, it harkens back to the long history of the gaming industry of trying to put on mechanics on insanity and madness sorts of mechanics. Like, this is what schizophrenia is like. This is what anxiety is like. You're like, I have anxiety. That's not what it's like. Um, <laughs> so so um, generally keeping it to a role-playing scope 
is the right way to approach it. And um, again, you know, gaming can be an excellent place to express those kind of things. And it can be a very educational place too. Like you could be teaching your neurotypical friends what, um, what autism is like through your character in a way that they don't get to experience elsewhere in their lives other than, you know, interacting with you. Or you could be teaching them a, a different way that it's expressed. It's, there's so, so much possibility in that. And it's just amazing. I highly encourage you to do this. Tell people that that's what you're doing and, you know, express it however you want. I think it could be a really great gaming experience. Ed, Chris, anything to add to that? Um, definitely do it. Um, sit down with your GM and tell, uh, this was a player, correct? This Not is a person know. who hasn't, he hasn't played yet. He hasn't role played. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, sit, sit down with your prospective GM, uh, hopefully a friend and just tell them what you want to do. Um, and, and be yourself. Don't, and this is kind of hard to say with about something like this, but try not to make too much of it, if you know what I mean. Um, but definitely be yourself. Don't, you know, and mm, this is- Are you point. talking about making it central to your character? No, not that. Yeah, try, right. It, your character yeah. is fine, but try not to make it game centric. You know what I mean? Like, like it's, I'm. It starts to become kind of tokenistic if you are making that the primary focus of your character. Right. Like, yeah. let me give you an example. If you were playing a gay character and everything you said, every joke you made, every encounter you had brought up that you were gay and this was the thing and it was funny and isn't it funny that you're gay and aren't gay characters funny then it starts to be annoying and not not very good like it's just it's just not great in terms of role playing like it starts to feel tokenistic like right. i'm the gay character i'm the black character yeah like yeah this is an aspect of your identity but it doesn't have to be your whole purpose for being in the story Right. right. Yeah. Don't don't make too much of it. Is is exactly what I would agree with. There's more things to the character than just that. Yeah. What you guys are saying. Right. And, and, and you, yeah. That used to be part of the the unwritten guidelines for doing uh, fantasy novels for established lines and established games. And somebody would say, "Well, why isn't there a X character, a gay character, um, a visibly handicapped character?" And okay, yes, but what is their story purpose? There, there should be more to them than that. Um, I mean, they the, should they should be there. Yeah, right. Obviously, they should be there. I mean, the game story should reflect real life, and it should have representations of people. You don't need a story justification for someone being a particular way. But that also, by the same token, that shouldn't be the only thing about them that's interesting. Bingo. Bingo. So they can they they need to be there, but that doesn't need to be the reason that they are there. Yeah. Right. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Right. That starts to get into really weird territory. Right. Like if a, if an if an autistic character, the reason that they're there is that they're autistic and that gives them some special ability to defeat the big bad evil guy or that allows them to be possessed by some sort of entity. These are bad tropes for autistic characters that we try to discourage out of stories. And, you know, you, you don't want, you, unless you really want to pursue that, in which case, all power to you, you know, yeah. you go for it. You do whatever you want. It's a role-playing game, your game. You do what you want. But um, consider if that's really what you want. Yeah, and the GM that's, that's, and the other players, and the GM and other players should be able to know in anything, you know, in any terms, whether it's like you said, if they're a gay character or an autistic character, or, you know, a person of color, they can. the The player should, everybody should be comfortable with whatever is going on. Yeah, and and, and okay with it. Representation Zero. matters. You are a person. You contain multitudes. 
your character is a person and should contain multitudes. Definitely. That's what I'm saying. Definitely. All right, guys. So we kind of touched on it earlier, overcoming stage fright. Uh, originally, when I wrote this down, I wrote it down as a concept for GMs because it's really difficult for a lot of GMs to you know, buckle down and say, I'm, I'm going to GM for a bunch of people. Here's a handful of people that I want to play role play with. We maybe we've never role played before. And we just picked up the book. A lot of people have done that picked up the book and that's their first time. Um, but they get that stage fright of, can I GM? Should I GM? What are some keys to kind of overcoming that stage fright or helping them overcome that stage fright? And this works for players as well, which we kind of touched on earlier. Ed, you want to give us a start? Start us off and we can go from yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the start would be that everybody should be relaxed. And and that's one of the reasons why we used to have um, session zeros when they were first um, mooted about. It was to everybody would relax and get to know each other if they didn't already. And everybody would chat about things because if you don't chat about things in real life, like the latest movie or the, the, the new um, mini series you're waiting for and everything, it's going to come out during the game anyway. And, and you might as well get it going at the beginning and get everybody with what they want to eat or drink and everybody, you know, so they're relaxed and they're talking already and then sort of roll into it. And I know there are people who are time pressured. And they get exasperated with, come on, I came here to, to play. Damn it, when are we going to start playing? You know, I, I've got to go in an hour, you know, sort of thing. But the, the getting everybody comfortable with each other is a rock bottom necessary first step. And then the, the second thing I would say is, if you are the uh, game master, dungeon master, referee, and you are comfortable role playing and you have decided what style you want to try and start the play session with, and you have any other veteran players, if they agree on that style beforehand, then you try and set that tone and see if the rest of the, the players, particularly the novices, will pick up on it and whether they're comfortable with it. It doesn't have to be a, no, you have to play like this, so you can't play at our table. It doesn't have to be like that at all. But... That having it happen around you and being comfortable with it and being able to just like dip your toe into it. So if you are the, the shy, silent type, um, having people talk in funny voices around you and, and play on a role, oh, it's okay to do this. Oh, okay. So that that is a, a good first step. So um, let me tell a little horror story. So the very first time I ever GM'd, um, I, you know, I was a kid, high school, probably 14. I was, no, no, 15. Anyway, uh, just getting into the game, really enjoying it. The imagination was running abound, so I created a, a dungeon to just run some friends through, whom I thought were friends. And, um, but the problem was, Two of the four people that I was running through this dungeon were much more experienced characters and had a vastly different idea of what D&D &D was about. This was first edition. Um, and so they promptly ran roughshod over everything I did as a GM to, quote, teach me how to play. And it damn near ran me off of the game. Um, but me being me, I kind of sulked for about a month and then said, screw you, I'll just never play with them again. And I didn't. And so myself and some other friends got together and started playing a different way entirely. Um, they were very much PVP players. They would murder other players. Wow. <laughs> and, and it's yeah. like, okay, where's the fun in this? This is not a competition. In my mind, it was a cooperative game. Right. Mm -hmm. It still is. And and they were just playing a different... And if that's the kind of game you want to play, fine. You know, armor up and go at it. And next time you'll be rolling up first level characters again. Um, I don't think that's a lot of fun. But um, I was too inexperienced to really just throw that out there. Is like, you know, here, here's a house rule. 
if you're going to murder another PC during the game, A, there's a serious chance everybody else is going to see it. All the other players, you know, all the other characters are going to see it. And then, where are you going to be? And B, is that really the way you want to play? You know, who mm. who's going to play the, you know, metagaming here? Who's going to play the game with you if all you ever do is slaughter their sixth level character that they've lovingly nurtured and and cultivated into this person and you know so having a talk with these people ahead of time about what kind of game we were going to play would have been infinitely valuable but i was too inexperienced to do that and to know i should have done that um and you know less a hard lesson learned but it almost put me off the game entirely so don't get put off the game by a bunch of dicks who are trying to quote teach you how to play the game there is no winning in a role-playing game that you can't win DD or pathfinder or starfinder or whatever you play and enjoy yeah that's the win right there mm -hmm. success is having a good time correct exactly that mm -hmm. the f word Fun. It kind of fun. It kind of sounds like you went through a series of bad relationships to finally find <laughs> the ones that you wanted. Which I mean, that's what gaming is. You know, you you go you go through a, a series of experiences. Some of them are going to work out for you, and some of them are not. So, like, if you are going in at, to get back to that stage fright thing, um, whenever people come to the table. They are going to come with their own experiences and their own history and their own expectations about how the game is going to go. And unless you're psychic. Ed, psychic? Yes. <laughs> okay. Unless you're Ed or psychic, <laughs> you are not going to know what everyone's going to expect. And if you don't know what everyone's going to expect, there's no way you can, you can meet everybody's expectations. You're not yeah. going to be perfect. Like, if you're watching Critical Role, and a lot of people who are starting to play D&D or are interested in playing D&D have interfaced with Critical Role in some capacity, they are going to come to the game expecting Matt Mercer to stride out of the darkness right. and run this game for them. And they are not going to get it. You are not Matt Mercer. Ed is not, Chris is not, I am not, Nick is not, none of us are. Mm -hmm. Everybody runs games differently. There is no reason to pressure yourself into being anyone. And I'm not saying this is a value thing. Matt's great, but Matt has his own particular style. Mm -hmm. And every DM can, has a different style. Find mm -hmm. yours. Mm -hmm. Find what works for you at the table. And if you find players who like that as well, keep them and keep gaming and, with them and to back up that story see i'm older than dirt well in this case what it meant was i was around before role-playing games except mm -hmm. except um the the role-playing game which has come down to us from napoleonic times which was really training officers for the fog of war um, which was, you know, separating people and having people be the little runners back and forth and give them all bad maps and they would have to relay unit orders, you know, and, and see what a mess they got into. Okay, and that has come down to us under different names for millennia. And because my father happened to be in NATO and NORAD, um, I got the the then current version of Let's play silly buggers, as he called it. Um, but it was it was officer training in communications. Um, but I mean, that was role playing uh, in, in terms of sand table wargaming, mm -hmm. and everything else was following Donald Featherstone's books about how to paint up your graphics miniatures and make the sand table and play a little encounter. And he would do the fog of war because he was so often doing. British people somewhere else in the world killing other people. Um, 
who were in their own native terrain and fighting it, you know, so it, it was the communications actually and ambushes and all that stuff made a, a difference, but that was role play. So when D and D started to come out as little booklets, how do you play this game? We were all making it up as we went along, right? Because there was no, first of all, there was no social media. Uh, you could not get anything like a role playing thing on television and you wouldn't for another 30 years and 30 years later it would be these little um skits done for businesses to role play dealing with difficult clients and they didn't get good until john cleese and and so on had a crack at doing them um those are hilarious to watch nowadays but i mean uh no, nothing we were all making it up as we went along and you found out how other people played it by getting together at a hobby store or at a convention, and they were scarcer than hen's teeth. And usually it was part of another convention, like a science fiction convention. Oh, they have a gaming room. And you'd sit down and go, what are these people doing? That's not D&D. Well, it was to them. Hmm. So we were all learning as we went, and we're not all ham actors. And yet at the same time, because I had parents who dragged me to Stratford Festival, which is a Shakespearean festival in Stratford, Ontario, every summer. And we sat through eight or nine Shakespeare plays. And I'd seen umpteen versions of the same classic play done with different casts and completely different dress and completely different way of directing it. It was like, hey, I can steal all this stuff. Right. I can do Lady Macbeth. Mm -hmm. What is this I see before me? The handle towards my hand. Come, let me clutch thee. And... If you, if you want to uh, learn how to be a better actor, there's actually a BBC series called Playing Shakespeare, where they actually set, sit down and they say, let's do Julius Caesar's speech again, as if he knows he's going to be betrayed. And they just play that five minute scene. And they say, let's do the speech again, as if this is all coming as a complete shock until the moment the knives come out. And the same veteran actors would play the same thing. And you go, wow. So tones of voice. So if you're if you want to do Matt Mercer, but you think I'm wooden, you know, OK, so watch some of these. See, that's it's that easy. And these actors are deliberately doing it in T-shirts and sneakers and sweatshirts. They're not dressing up in costume. They're not overwhelming you with their polish. They're deliberately just doing it with their voice and the timing and their acting and say, oh, so just these little ticks of delivery. I can make it more interesting for the people at the table. I don't have to be a character actor. I don't have to spend tons of money on costumes. I don't have to spend tons of money on minis. Yeah, I can just use all the little men out of my sorry game. You know, they're, where they're all red and blue and they're little men. Or I can use sugar cubes. That's what my father and, and uh, his aunties used to use, sugar cubes, because they could buy this box of sugar cubes. And they could use it, and, and they were told to stop playing with the beans because <laughs> the beans would end up all over the floor and everything. So they would use sugar cubes, and 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 you'd think, oh, that's brilliant. Okay. And then it's then it brings it back to the storytelling, not the trappings. Right. And if you right. if you watch Critical Role and you get overwhelmed or awed or I can't do that, what you're doing is stumbling over the trappings. You don't need any of that stuff. And Shakespeare can be brilliant when it's done by six kids on a makeshift stage. Sometimes they'll catch fire and the scene will go great. And their parents who are sitting there in the deck chairs going, when will this end? Oh my <laughs> God, will suddenly start applauding because the scene worked. And for five minutes, little Johnny was Henry the fourth or Henry the fifth was Macbeth was, you know, the, the mm -hmm. two houses alike in majesty suddenly came to life. And that's the cool thing about role playing. And you don't have to be an expert. And even the experts, if they're playing the same play, 336 performances in a row every night at 7 p.m., they're going to flub some lines. Yeah. They're going to have some things go wrong. And they're mm -hmm. just going to power through it and keep going. And it doesn't matter. And the people watching won't even notice. They won't even right. realize <laughs> they screwed up half the time. Yeah. Yeah, and, Tr and I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I I once went to the Shaw Festival in Niagara on the Lake, and they had a brand new theater, no windows, and they had a power cut in the middle, 
and the power cut went on for over an hour in the middle of a performance and it was pitch dark people couldn't safely leave the theater because it was a raped theater with steps everywhere they couldn't see to get out and one of the actors on stage happened to be a veteran british actor called stanley holloway if you've seen my fair lady he's the guy singing get me to the church on time okay hmm. and he grew up doing monologues in in dialect on the radio so in the pitch darkness, he just started doing monologues from memory <laughs> Wow! for an hour. When wow. the lights came back up, he stopped to go on with the play, and the audience said, no, no, don't stop. I want to hear the end of this. <laughs> so I um, just want to throw in that, that about the most joyful things about role-playing games, when, when a, a player will say something or a gaffe or a comment or a line, that comes out of the ether, out of nowhere, that leaves everybody in the room absolutely in stitches. Here's, here's my favorite example. So I'm running the troop through um, a deep, deep cavern, and they run into a mushroom forest. And uh, it's a bard, a rogue, and a ranger, and I can't remember what the fourth guy, oh, warrior. Um, and so they run across a, a fairly low level character, a, a, a troop of bugbears. And they're fixing to attack. And the bard being the bard, and she was the face of the group, of course, um, jumped out in front and says, wait, 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 wait. And I rolled for it. OK, they're at least intrigued why this tiny little half elfin woman is standing out in front of them with her hands up going, wait. Her? We're, uh, and she kind of stumbled because she didn't know where she was going with this. We're park rangers. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, park rangers? And she went into this whole spiel about how this underground forest was an environment and how it was fragile and they had to da -da 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 -da. and I was like, okay, you don't have to roll for that. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, for the rest of the entire night, they had to pose as park rangers in charge of guarding the underground mushroom forest from, from being trampled and denuded and hacked to pieces. And oh, <laughs> just priceless. It was, it was everybody in the room was just like taking a piss. It was just <laughs> very funny. And it just came out of nowhere. It was an absolute throwaway line. And because I, I was, because she was smart enough to come up with it and I was smart enough to make something out of it. So here's something for the new GM out there. Don't throw anything away. If one of your one of your players comes up with a non sequitur like that, make something of it. If they mention Shakespeare in character, who is this person who shakes spears? You know, they go yes. with that. You can you can play with things and and see where they go. It's just that's the inventive imagination thing that is just so amazing about role playing games. So yeah. For sure, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, I do want to mention something with the with the overcoming the stage fright that you guys kind of touched on, and it sparked a memory uh, that a, a, a player or a GM they can do multiple different things when they have the stage fright to overcome that, and that's and in my mind, it's you can GM for a bunch of really experienced role players, and I know that sounds daunting, but you pull them aside and say, "Hey, I want a GM." for you guys. Um, I'm not an experienced GM. I want to run like a one shot for you guys. And then you guys can kind of walk me through what I did good, what I didn't do. Um, help me out with that. And that way you get experience from people who have done it for a while and you can learn. And, and obviously people you're comfortable with. Uh, so that way you get this feedback from the people who have done it, who you trust to help you along the way. The other one is of course, all new players that don't know any better because you don't know any better and you tell them, hey, I don't know, you don't know, let's learn this together. And so, that was two things that I had thought of. 
the first the first scenario there the good thing about that is yes you will get feedback you'll get four different feedbacks from four different people <laughs> every gm is just like every author they're going right. to do things a little their differently way. right so yes do that but then take what you like about that advice given to you by each of these experienced people don't take every little morsel as gospel right what you're doing as a new gm is finding your place finding your style finding your and, and that's like trying to tell a new writer how to write right it's impossible you sit down you use your imagination and you write yeah. you know it's one of those things i'm glad you made it made that distinction because that really does matter there was there's been a discussion in the chat mm -hmm. about making mistakes as a dm and like the players will not know that you made a mistake unless you draw attention to it and it has it has sparked this thought in my mind that part of your job as a dm is to be an effective con artist it's True. to convince your players that you got this and you know what you're doing and you planned them you planned all of this like yep. the story as it's going, this is exactly how you wanted it to go. And you're glad that they led you in this position. And meanwhile, in your head, you're going, crap, crap, crap. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? But, you know, just trust yourself. Just keep going with it. Right. Ideas will come to you. And if you're really stuck, you know, if at some point in the game, the players do something unexpected, they destroy your encounter, they kill the boss way too easy, everything is you know, done, you don't have any more planning. It is okay for you to stop the session there so that you can go do some planning or just say, you go back to the bar. What do you do to celebrate your victory? And then let them do their thing while you are planning. Right. Okay. Somebody walks in with a gun. <laughs> I want, you know, I wanted off of that because Chris was mentioning the, the, the whole, you know, the forest and going off the one wimp. Also, when you do that, that one player goes, oh my gosh, I got this right the whole time. Like I made that joke, <laughs> but I didn't realize the whole game was going to be actually that. And oh, they shit. don't yeah. know. So that's the joy of working, of, of playing with people who know you really, really, really well. They knew it was all just made up from there on out, but that's the joy of it. You know, that's mm -hmm. like, okay, let's see how Chris can really dig this one out of the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty damn good at digging some gems out of the toilet. Yeah. You will have a conversation over beer several years later where you're like, yeah, I had no idea what the hell was going to happen. You know, you're in you're all in tears just slapping your asses off, you know? It's like, uh, I had another character who was trying to convince um, some somebody that he wasn't as big as, you know, his big character. I'm not large, I'm just far away. And he got me. <laughs> And so he was like myopic for the whole rest of the day. So awesome. <laughs> well, we uh, are. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. What were you going to say, Nick? No, go ahead moderators. and get. Go ahead and go ahead and get yours in first, and then uh, we'll start. I was going to say. Up. I was going to say, there are sometimes when you will make a mistake, and you will not be happy with how you ruled something, and you will not be happy with something that you introduced to your game, like. For instance, um, one of your players goes off and makes um, a, a terrible decision. They have stolen something. They murdered somebody. They made a pact with an evil entity, whatever. And you, at the time, were like, I'm going to roll with it, and it's going to be great, and it's going to lead to great story stuff. And only after that, you realize that your player is just not interested in doing that. They're like, I'm not going to play a traitor character. I'm not going to keep this from the party. I don't know how to play a character like that. And you're like, crap. So sometimes you're going to have to find ways to tie things back and tie things off. And the best way to do that sometimes is to sit down with everybody and say, hey, so I've introduced this problem to the game and I'd like to solve it what do you guys think? You know, because your players will often have really good ideas and really good suggestions for you. So 
It was Trust all yourself. a dream. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's fantasy. You can do that. <laughs> trust yourself and trust your players. That's what I'm saying. Evil thief steal the MacGuffin from them. Um, or you nerf it a little bit. Um, I've done that. I, I gave somebody a, a, a magical sword that was way overpowered, and I then later came back and limited it. Um, you had to do a critical hit for it to have its magical effect. And it was that simple, you know. And the player was like, yeah, I kind of thought it was a little bit overpowered. It's like, it, it is, and now, you know, it only takes its magical effect when you do a critical hit. And that nerfed it perfectly. And so he didn't rely on it for the whole rest of the campaign. So... You know, you just you have to roll with your roll with your mistakes, bring them out in the open if if they're egregious and they are they affect how the game is being played, how the scenario is going. And then just like like Eric said, you know, discuss it and say, I'm going to nerf this and this is why if you think I'm nerfing it too much or X, Y, Z, let's discuss it. But, you know. This is a game affecting thing and I don't want to screw things up because if it does screw things up, we're just going to have less fun. You know? Definitely. Well, thank you guys for being a part of the show. Uh, very much appreciated you guys swinging in there. Uh, everyone who's watching the stream, you can catch all these guys. They're all on social media. Um, I list their Twitter handles. They'll scroll by on their face. The Edverse for Ed Greenwood at Chris A. Jackson for Chris Jackson. Eric Scott to be. And I said it right again. Yep. Is absolutely. at Eric Scott to be. Those are all on Twitter. Um, Ed's been working on Fate of the Norn stuff, so you can check that stuff out. Chris has a brand new book out. Pacifica just came out. You're working on another follow up book, right? Uh, the second book is actually out. The second book in the series is Stratos. Okay. It takes place in a gas giant. It is hard science fiction. Oh, and nice. I'm working on a third one, which is called Vesuvia. Okay. Which have something to do with volcanoes i'm not too sure awesome and i love the first two books i love them it's i bounced them off of ed uh yeah yeah they're lots of fun it's it's hard science fiction yeah it's 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 lots of fun the fivefold universe it was created by uh uh dj bowden um and uh he's got three books out and we are recruiting other authors as we speak um awesome, it's awesome. it's a fun universe it is far future hard science fiction which i haven't really written a lot of and it's it's kind of releasing to finally get into it writing in somebody else's universe because i don't have to work about worry about the mechanics right right and eric is you can find him on dungeon scrawlers uh right here on twitch eric's got some projects coming up last i spoke with you you couldn't talk about them i'm assuming that is still the case <laughs> well um i'm finishing up the edits on that book that i couldn't talk to you about um okay. it hasn't been announced so i can't i can't say anything about it but but you can find some new fiction from chris and myself that recently came out in the book god slayer in the basil and mobius series oh, yeah. which is um kind of a noir uh modern day lovecraft mystery pulp story and it is like okay if indiana jones and james bond teamed up to go kill cthulhu that is the basil and mobius property right there and it is amazing so yeah highly so, recommended i have to tell you the story <laughs> i order each one of those from my local indie bookstore because otherwise i would never see them and mm -hmm. i ordered the latest one and I still haven't received it because the ladies who run the bookstore are reading it first. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you'll get it when we're done. <laughs> this is our evil plan because we are evil. This is our plan. <laughs> That's great. Of course, if you guys want to hear more from any of these three guests, uh, you can check out the Epic Realms podcast. Uh, Ed's been on there twice. Chris has been on there. Eric's recently come back for his second episode. I'm sure we'll have Chris back for a second episode as well, as well as future episodes. So go ahead and check that out anywhere you get your podcasts. Also, uh, coming up on April 4th, we're going to have New York Times bestselling author Kirsten White will be joining us here on Twitch for the podcast recording. She wrote the Paranormalcy series, Conqueror Saga, Slayer, Star Wars Padawan, the list goes on and on. Nice. We're going to talk about her upcoming book, Hive. We've got lots of people coming up as well as another Dungeon Scrawlers alumni. Rhiannon Held will be joining us on May 2nd as well. So uh, stay tuned for that. You can see Octavius, uh, one of our moderators, posted that in the chat all of our upcoming and our past guests so again thank you guys so much 
Uh, April 30th is going to be the next Game Masters Workshop. I'm still finalizing our guests for that. So put it on your calendar. April 30th will be the next Game Masters Workshop right here on Twitch. So for these three gentlemen, I am Nick, and we're going to do a raid. And I'm going to thank you all for joining us. Um, we're going to go raid. We're, we're talking DMing and role-playing, and we're going to throw a raid where we send all of our viewers over to another stream. And we're going to go braid some people that are role playing uh a guy that is pretty well known as far as gms he's all over twitch and a twitch gm and um i may send him a message to see at some point if he wants to come on this show so we're gonna send the raid that way to captain robear on twitch and uh raid them so thank you all very much and thank you to my three guests i appreciate you guys coming in it's been a lot of fun thank you thank you so have a great, great. night everyone and thank you and we'll see you down the road